Today, uh, we are going to finish up Ernest Hemingway's Sun Also Rises. We left our last lecture noticing that for Hemingway, there are two fundamental truths about the human condition. First, human beings are unable to overcome their alienation and suffering by joining together. Political communities, marriage, friendships, religious communities or religious faith, none of them join people together in unproblematical ways. All of them, political communities, marriages, friendships, religious communities, become empty, inauthentic, oppressive shams, held together momentarily by guilt perhaps, but they are all destined to disintegrate. Human beings may want this to be different than it is. They may wish that communities actually solve the problem of human alienation. There is some sort of crash going on next door. <laughs> they may wish that these institutions would satisfy people, but being a man means that you understand the inescapable reality of emptiness. People may try to change locations, such as Cohn, who wants to go to South America, or dream that it could be different, like Lady Brett. Yet, that is the way of the world. This condition of emptiness, this condition where communities don't genuinely satisfy human alienation, is especially true in Paris, where the reality of lonely death can be papered over. But that just makes Paris more empty than any other place. It's the city that papers over the genuine human reality. Death is the fundamental human experience and we experience death alone, even if we are surrounded by family and friends. So communities are inauthentic because they paper over the fundamental human experience. Second, we see in this novel that civilized human beings attempt to paper over this fundamentally alienating and lonely experience through transient distractions or fleeting pleasures. Sexual alliances, for instance, drinking. If Hemingway wrote this book in 2013, he might use drugs and video games and pornography as things that distract us from the fundamental experiences. But whatever the distraction, it is all an attempt to hide the ultimate reality from those not strong enough to see it. The ultimate rea reality, as I say for Hemingway, is that we all die lonely deaths. He might be wrong about this as the ultimate reality, though I think it is quite sure that all of you will die Sorry, but that is my prediction, and I'm a political scientist. His point seems to be something like this. There is no community for human beings, and there is no genuine unhappiness, though I suppose there might be less collective unhappiness due to distraction. Hemingway's characters seem pretty miserable because Hemingway's characters seem very distracted. <laughs> it's almost as if Hemingway would like to divide the world into those who recognize the fundamental reality and nevertheless live, and those who don't recognize the fundamental reality and distract themselves in their lives. Ms. Conrad. So you're saying that they're unhappy because they're distracted? 
or there is that is that what you're saying? My I'm saying that the best those who don't recognize the reality can aspire to is distraction. You have your choice. You have a civilization full of those people like Jake who recognize death as the fundamental reality. And you have the, a civilization of those who do not want to look the fundamental reality in the face. And therefore, death is staring them at the sp in the face and they instead turn on The Price is Right. Is that still on? I mean, that's the last TV show I watched. Bob Parker. <laughs> no, 2K. Whatever. <laughs> <coughs> now, if there is any hope, we get the hope in Hemingway's part two and three. But don't expect too much from parts two and three. We've discussed this to an extent in our discussion sections this past week, and I want to try to summarize what we have discovered, okay? We've talked about this stuff somewhat ad nauseum. Happiness seems possible, and Jake and Bill experience happiness in nature while fishing in chapter 10. We see that Bill's face is sweaty and happy, Hemingway's words. This is often what happens in Hemingway's books. The protagonist becomes happy. The best example, even better than the one in Sun Also Rises, is the example of Nick Adams in Hemingway's greatest book, In Our Time. Nick Adams is the hero. He returns from the war. He returns to Michigan. He finds happiness only when he flees civilization and lives alone in the woods. He spends his time fishing. He was happy, Hemingway writes. What was happy about this time for Nick Adams? What, what made him happy about fishing? Why did this confrontation with fish in a river conduce to happiness? Hemingway tells us exactly in this book, in our time, page 179. He left his civilized concerns behind. And he left behind the need for thinking, the need to write, and other needs. The same seems to hold true for Jake and Bill. When they are fishing, there is no need to think. There is no conflict in their soul. There are no deadlines, no writing assignments, even for these writers who write for a living. There are no sexual concerns. There are no injustices to worry about. It is life reduced to its bare minimum a man and a fish. And I am tempted to say that this is a third fundamental aspect of Hemingway's thought. Immersion in nature is the only source of human happiness. But I want us to recognize what immersion in nature means. It doesn't mean simply being in nature. So let us think about a fish. Is a fish happy? No fish would answer that question. The fish doesn't know he is unhappy. He is not even concerned about the question of whether or not he is happy. The fish just is. The fish lives in the stream of nature. He is living a natural life. He is just hanging out. So fish are not unhappy. Fish exist without any conflict. No sexual conflict, no writing deadlines, no need for thinking, no other needs. A fish just is. Nick becomes happy in, in our time 
and Jake and Bill become happy in the sun also rises when they fish, right? They are happy. They lose themselves. In fact, let's put a very fine point on it. They become like fish when they fish. They have no worries, no cares, no thoughts. Human beings become happy for Hemingway when they become less human. When the things that define us as beings, thought, speech, sexual possession, when they are obscured or effaced, we can be happy. Human beings become happy by becoming less human and more fish-like. This is what it means to lose oneself in nature. This is what it means to lose one's consciousness to nature. <coughs> so this, I would submit, is the third aspect of Hemingway's thought. Life is good when it is based on simple, pure, natural sensations. Though those sensations are not uniquely human. They are shared with the animal kingdom. And, I presume, vegetables. And human beings are constantly searching for these simple, pure, natural sensations. They are constantly seeking to lose themselves. They are constantly seeking to lose the civilized veneer that puts conflict in our souls. Perhaps the pursuit of sex, so prevalent among the Paris crowd, is but another way of pursuing pure, simple, and natural sensations. Though, of course, Jake can no longer experience those. Perhaps drinking can be like those pure, simple, and natural sensations, too. You lose yourself in your civilized inhibitions. And perhaps we can apply this once again to today's world and say drug use could be a way of pursuing, not in an adequate way, but pursuing pure, simple, natural sensations. Or perhaps, and I don't know this for a fact, one can lose oneself in a video game. The key is that all are distracted and distracting <coughs> pastimes are inadequate attempts to find what Bill and Jake in The Sun Also Rises and Nick Adams in our time get fishing. You're playing video games, but what you really want is to fish. You're doing drugs, you're drinking, you're having sex, but what you really want is to fish. <laughs> Genuinely losing yourself and dropping what is civilized about you in the process. <coughs> so maybe those who seek distraction in Paris are really just feebly seeking the pure and natural sensations of the big-hearted river. Another one of Hemingway's short stories. Now, some people don't want to fish. Cone, for instance, says he wants to fish, but doesn't. Why? What does this reveal about his character? What it reveals about Cohn's character is that he is incapable of happiness. Or rather, that he ranks the civilized concerns of sex 
and the illusion, illusions of human community above the sense that there might be something beyond or below these things. His concerns are what ultimately call Bill and Jake away from their happiness too. The concerns of civilization always seem to intrude again. Now the central question, I think, of part three of The Sun Also Rises revolves around this character, Ramiro, the bullfighting prodigy. What does Ramiro stand for? What does he mean? How is he perceived? Why is he significant to the plot of this book? Well, what Ramiro is, it's a bullfighter. And if we're going to understand what bullfighting is, we need to think about bullfighting. If we're going to understand Ramiro, we should probably think about his craft. Bullfighting is, no doubt, a confrontation with brutal nature. Something that, an, an activity that puts us on the edge between life and death. And we know it. It brings us close to death. In other words, bullfighting is reality. Made real. Think of it like this. None of us think that walking on the sidewalk is a confrontation with death. Even though right next to us, cars drive by at 35 miles an hour, right? But if those were bulls, we would think of it, right? That's the confrontation with brutal nature, unpredictable nature. Civilized people continue generally to drive on the, on the road unless they're really old and running into fruit stands. Um, but those are stories from years, years ago. Now, when Ramiro kills a bull during bullfighting, I hope you guys caught this, he loses himself in the bull. He mixes himself in the bull. He merges with nature. The words that Hemingway uses are, he and the bull become one. Page 167, 168, 220 in my edition. None of your editions. It is the same kind of happiness that Jake experiences fishing and that Nick Adams experiences fishing in the other book. And bullfighting seems to combine the confrontation with death and the losing oneself to nature in a way that few other activities can or could. Fishing isn't dangerous unless you're fishing sharks or piranhas trying to grab with your hand after you've had some cuts. Fishing is not dangerous. Bullfighting is. Therefore, it is a confrontation with death. And a successful bullfighter has the same feeling, the same sensations, the pure natural sensation of victory over nature that the fisherman has. Reeling in a fish and killing a bull make you feel the same. But bullfighting is even more real than fishing because of the death part. <coughs> so bullfighting, just as an activity, seems to be perfectly designed to make man true to his genuine, simple self. It's quite a revealing thing. And it is perhaps for this reason that the Basque people have made bullfighting into such a festival and put bullfighting at the center of their culture. I think it's not too much of a stretch to say that in this book, 
the bullfighting takes the place of religion. And in fact, the bullfighting week is also a religious festival. What brings the people to Pamplona? The religious festival and bullfighting. Two activities that are melded into one in this great festival. Bullfighting brings out religious sentiments in the people of the Basques. Devotion, admiration, attention, spectacle. And into this culture steps Jake. Is Jake an insider or an outsider to this culture? The answer, of course, is yes. He is an insider because he genuinely appreciates the action. Remember, even back in Paris, he followed the bullfighting through the newspapers. He is a connoisseur of bullfighting. He knows the good ones from the bad ones and can explain the difference. He's definitely in some way on the inside. He appreciates it. But on the other hand, he's on the outside. Right, and this brings forth the genuine contradiction in Jake. The man who appreciates Pedro more than any other character also turns Pedro into a sort of victim. It's Jake's appreciation for the bullfighting culture, if I can talk like that, that um, inclines him to protect Pedro. There's this wonderful episode that was discussed in, uh, many of your, in both the discussion groups where uh, Montoya has gotten an invitation to relate to Pedro to go to the Grand Hotel or something akin to the Grand Hotel. And um, which is a little bit like inviting him to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Montoya is inclined not to deliver that invitation, and he asks Jake for his advice. And Jake says, yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't deliver that. People don't appreciate the value of that young man. Jake protects Pedro from Brett and her ilk, right? The sluts from Paris would corrupt Pedro. At the same time, later on, a slut from Paris, Brett, asks Jake for an invitation, or excuse me, that's not the right word, um, for an introduction to Pedro, and Jake willingly does it. Yes? Is that you mean Romero? What did I say? Pedro? Yeah. His last name is Romero. Pedro Romero, I think, is his name. Thank you, though. Um, uh, so, where was I? Um, introduction. Jake wants an introduction, or Brett wants an introduction to Pedro, and Jake delivers it. He didn't have to. What happened to the reason that he gave Montoya? People don't appreciate the value of this young man. Is Jake inclined to think that Brett will? appreciate the value of this young man against all his experience with Brett. Jake clearly betrays Montoya. And that is exactly how Montoya perceives it, and that's exactly how Jake perceives it while he's doing it. It's like there's a little Montoya angel on his shoulder saying, no, don't introduce Pedro to that woman. And he does anyways. And later on, Montoya cuts off all relations with, with Jake. This is something an outsider would do. This is something someone who doesn't appreciate the greatness of Pedro would do. Why does he do it? Let me venture a reason that shows something about Jake's character and his problems. 
Jake goes with the flow in this particular case, right? He is not able to say no to Brett. What does that reveal about him? It reveals that he has no future orientation, nor a much of a past orientation. He burns his bridges to Pamplona. He doesn't think, think, he doesn't think about how this action will undermine himself, Montoya, Pedro, or the festival. He cuts himself off from all future enjoyment there in Pamplona. Jake doesn't care. Should be obvious. And of course, Ramiro, <coughs> Pedro Ramiro goes on to have great exploits. He fights the bull, he kills the bull. Brett and he seem to be getting along great. They move back, uh, he moves back to Madrid. Brett seems to be moving in with him. And perhaps we're allowed to think at this point Jake has done the right thing. Perhaps he has made Brett happy without corrupting Pedro. And in fact, he doesn't corrupt Pedro. Pedro is the same guy in Madrid that he was in Pamplona. He wants a traditional woman. He asks Brett to, what, grow out her hair, which I take to be some sort of preparation for motherhood. That's how it always ends up in the Conway Twitty songs. She lowers down her hair, next thing you know. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's Charlie Rich, Charlie Rich. Uh, not Conway Twitty, strike that from the record. But there is a Conway Twitty song where she lets down her hair. But I can't recall what it is though. But when we get behind. So Ramiro and Brett break up when she won't grow her hair out, won't play the role of a traditional mother. But it's quite revealing and actually the only noble action that you ever see from Brett, I would, I would submit, she leaves him. She leaves Pedro in Madrid and says, look, I guess I could have stayed, right? He was having a good time. But I didn't want to be one of those bitches that corrupt the youth. And that reveals about her something very interesting. She realizes she's corrupt. She realizes that she is divided. She does not belong to a whole culture. She cannot grow her hair out. She cannot become a mother. And ultimately, Brett sees that she will be a shell of her former self. The world will recognize her as a shell of her former self. She will eventually lose her beauty. Jane Fonda to the contrary notwithstanding, still. This, of course, makes her depressed. She calls Jake. It's not so much the leaving of Pedro Ramiro that causes the problem in Brett, but, the, but that her view of herself as an old woman comes to her. So we, what do we learn about Ramiro from this episode? Ramiro wants her to be a wife and a mother. And I take that to be that Ramiro wants her to live closer to nature, closer to the pure, 
uncivilized sensations that can define fish and people. And Brett knows she cannot do that. She has tried to be a wife and a mother twice and failed. So she leaves him. And it's after she leaves Pedro that we get this central question of the novel thrown back into our face. We brought it up last time we were together. Could Jake and Brett have been happy had Jake not been emasculated? And let's just think about that question. Here's what's at stake in that question, all right? If Jake and Brett could be happy, their community would have a natural basis, a basis in sexual union. And that is the great hope, the great possibility in the relationship between Jake and Brett. Their sexual union could have formed the basis for a genuine union, a genuine community, something that overcomes the normal human alienation. And her idea that they could have been happy suggests that with sex, there can be love. But the obverse is also true. No sex, no love. Brett holds on to this illusion. Sex, sexual union, can be the basis for a genuine community. She has, after all, married twice. What's the second marriage? The triumph of hope over experience. Right? And she seems to look at Jake and say, ah, what could have been. <coughs> she holds on to this illusion. Jake, however, is much more hard-boiled and cynical about it. He knows it would not have worked out. His answer to her when she says we could have made a great pair, as we mentioned, is it, isn't it pretty to think so? Jake recognizes that there is no relationship between sex and love. Sexual union is just as empty and oppressive and alienating as impotence. And that, for Hemingway, is the truth. That is, Jake understands things better than Brett. She's an idealist, a lover, a hoper. Jake understands things. So Jake ultimately gives a secular interpretation of the title. As we mentioned in both the discussion groups, the title is drawn from Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon at some, in, during some dark days. The context of that quotation is very important. So, uh, the, the, the quote is drawn from what, you know, the first chapter, fourth, fifth, sixth verses of Ecclesiastes. And in it, Solomon is making the following point. Human endeavor is useless. Individual life is insignificant. Striving is insignificant. Love is insignificant. Labor is insignificant.
the title of this book reinforces the skepticism or cynicism about all human things characteristic of Solomon's thought at this point. But there's a difference. Solomon's skepticism is qualified or checked by a faith that the Lord, that one can rest in the Lord and find completion outside of this world. The things of this world are vain when compared with the greatness of God, is Solomon's point. Jake's and Hemingway's point seems to be the things of this world are vain, period. Hemingway gives us skepticism or cynicism without faith. And manliness consists in living despite this, in continuing to live and struggle despite the vanity of all things. And I say that the fact that Hemingway ultimately committed suicide seems to indicate that he took his thought pretty seriously. And I will open up the floor for questions. Ms. Forrest. Um, when you were talking about sex and love being kind of equal, or one way to the other, is he saying that that's a universal truth? I think he I think it's a universal illusion that sexual union can form the basis